good afternoon, first year English majors. For this afternoon, we are going to have our ADEPT review, specifically in EL 101, Language, Culture, and Society. I hope that most of you already has an idea of what is this course is all about since we you are i mean you already had this course last semester so i am hoping that we will just do a run through but you will have a full grasp of this course so let's start we will have this definition and origin of language of course we have to de define it first and what is language it is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols by means of which a social group cooperates. I wanted to highlight the meaning of language through this definition from Trader and Blotch. So look at this word by word. I wanted you to focus. First, it is a system. Okay, Language is a system because we can just do language and systematize like you get this language from there and there and there because rules is there every language has its own rule and we cannot do a certain rule if there is no system next is arbitrary when we talk about arbitrary its opposite is iconic okay or icon arbitrary is something that is not really related to the language we talk about. Like, for example, a chair. How were we able to call this a chair? Like, what's the origin? Does it have a chair written on it? There's none. That's why there's no rela relationship between what we call to that object and to its actual um, appearance. Okay, so that is arbitrary. No relationship. It just come up like that, like letter A, ah, where it came from, the system, where does it came from, and then vocal, because language is primarily vocal. The first um, language that we learn is through what? Through the language or through oral language. And then, of course, symbols. We have the symbols. It can be written or oral. And then, by means of which a social group cooperates. Guys, a language will not be called a language unless it is used by a social group. Okay, so lots of people should be uh, what they call this using the language and that it is their way of communication. Everyone cooperates in using that. Like, for example, if I invented any language, for example, I, I invented a language called Lala. It's just an example, okay? Now, if whenever I say Lala, okay, you do not cooperate, you do not use the word Lala. Therefore, I cannot say that this Lala is a language since I am the only one using it. So, language is a system of arbitrary vocal symbols by means of which a social group cooperates. That's the definition that we will take for this afternoon. Also, in addition by Henry Sweet, it is an expression of ideas. Whenever we use the language, we express ourselves. We give reflections. We interact with people. And then there is, uh, we use speech sounds into words, and the words combine the sentence, and then sentences to the whole thought that we wanted to express. Next, how about the origin of language? Have you thought about it? Like, saan nga pinanggaling? Right. Have you ever thought like, does it does it just pop or anything? Well, for this discussion, I know you're also familiar with this. There are three sources as to where we are as to where the language originates. First is biblical, second is historical, and the third is mythological. Let's go with biblical. In the Bible, Genesis 2.19, this is where Adam was created by God. And then when uh, God gave this life, gave life to a man, he suddenly told Adam, okay, I will give you a power 
to name everything that you see. So Adam started naming everything, and that is the origin of language. Another from Genesis chapter eleven, verse five to six. It is about the ba uh, the Tower of Babel. Okay, I know you're familiar. We're in. They wanted to reach God that they created that a high tower and after this high tower god became uh, became angry and so he removed language to them and it became diverse because back then language is this one but then god wanted to uh, make them struggle for building such towers so they make them not understand each other okay so that's the biblical historical is from max Mueller, 1861 we have the bawow we're in Bawa refers to imitation of the cries. Okay, Bawa is the cries of the beasts and birds. Puhu is the emotional interjection word of pain. It's about vibration. And then Yohihu, it is more of a muscular effort like heaving, like um, getting something, um, what do you call this? Heavy. Okay, so that's it. Like we got these words or we got this language from the sounds that we get from the environment. And so it develops and evolves. Mythology, uh, mythology, mythological, okay, mythological. From Greek mythology, we also have East African people and the American Great Flood. Uh, with the Greek mythology in East Africa, there is like a famine that happens. You know, you're familiar with that. And then when this famine happens, uh, they just become uh, like insane and they speak a lot of words, okay? A lot of uh, words because they are too hungry and so language started to, to be created because back then they believed there just one language and suddenly there's a famine and people got insane and so these people that got insane produce a new language and that's it. American Great Flood is where the people with one language goes to other parts of the city or a town or a country and then they created their own language. Okay, so that's it. So a. Bernard says, myths are never just stories. They always occur in the context of mythological context of a mythological system, which is specific to a given society or culture. Now, for the history of English language, we cannot really tell where do the language came from, but the English language somehow can be tracked. Okay. okay, for the history and origin of English language, um, Old English, 5th century to 11th century, so it happens that there are three groups, the Jutes, the Saxons, and the Angles, and then they invade this place, and they have this language called Englalaland. Now they form it the Anglicic, so it produces be strong, and water, and that is the Old English. Then here comes Middle English, where it, there's a Viking invasion, and the French were left, okay, and... This French, okay, we, Old English was left to the peasants, and despite its glamorous status, it continued to develop and grow by adopting a whole host of Latin French words. So, when this Viking occurs, the Old English now becomes the language of those peasant people. But they believe that you will use only Old English if you're a peasant, something like that. So, of course, a lot of people move from, middle, uh, from Old English to Middle English. The modern English is the Queen Elizabeth time or the golden age wherein a lot of literature, Shakespearean literature also come out. 
And look at this. For number one, that is an example of Old English. So I cannot really read that one. For number two, that is Middle English. T is modern. Somehow we can already we can already perceive that. And of course, number four, this is this is the uh, the contemporary, okay, the contemporary language that we have. So this is from the Anglo-Saxon poetry, an example of Old English. So look at that. Look at the text and even the symbols as to how it is written. Beowulf is also written in Old English. Now, in Middle English, it is more of um, the French world. We're in the friar, knight, miller, these are French word. And you see, it is sophisticated. The language of French are very sophisticated. And you can see that in Middle English languages. Early modern English is also Edmund Spencer and at the same time Shakespeare. Late modern English, they started to become very particular in terms of the grammar. And then here's the contemporary English. We also have these slangs that is arising right now. So that's how our language arises. As long as our language is living and a lot of people uses it, it will continue to evolve. So what are some linguistic terms in culture and society? These are the things you have to remember. And terms of speaking with language. First, we have first language and second language. I know you are, or, uh, you are all familiar. First language is native language, and the second language is um, our, the second language itself, the language you learn after the native language. Like, for example, your first language is Filipino, and your second language is English. This is the language that you learn from school. So, Tell me, what is your L1? How about your L2? Well, your L1 is Filipino and your L2 is English. Microlinguistic study and macrolinguistic study. So, this two is the study about the language itself. When we talk about micro, it is in depth but very specific. Like, for example, we study language in terms of pronunciation, in terms of sentence structure, in terms of the definition of language. Okay, but for macro study, we study language, but we use other fields. Like, for example, how language is used in the society, its function in psychology. What is the language of biologists? Okay, so that is macro, bigger field, but with micro specific. So this is an example. Micro, phonetics, phonology, but with macro, psycholinguistics, social linguistics, and so on and so forth. Prescriptive and descriptive, we also use this most of the time. Prescriptive is our those grammar Nazis that is very strict in terms of using grammar sentence structure and vocabulary that they stick with the rule once you uh for example you do not follow the rule then it's wrong but for the descriptivists they believe that as long as you can understand its meaning okay as long as you can understand the meaning and it, it has its function therefore it is a uh, descriptivist and it is acceptable like for example what is the correct term is it i was or i were so if it's a pre prescriptivist he or she will choose just one but if it's a descriptivist they will believe that both of this phrase is correct so there's established rule but for descriptivist content is more important for prescriptivist it is recognized this one language worldwide and for the descriptivist, language belongs to the people, like it depends how we use the language. Rule breaking is mistake for prescriptivist, for, but for descriptivist, rule breaking is progress. Okay. Next is the synchronic and the diachronic. So this is the span of time. We are talking about the span of time as to when we study a language. When we talk about synchronic, we study a language on a particular time. Like, for example, what is the language of PCCM student? Okay. 
to nowadays, like um, in the first semester. What is their language that they are using? But for diachronic, we use long time span. Like what is the language of Filipino people from 20th, uh, 20th, 20th century to 21st century? So a long span of time. Okay, so that's how we analyze a language like according to span. So synchronic and diachronic. So that's an example. So you see diachronic, we study that with a, an overall, but for synchronic, we are just focusing on one strand. So that's it for our part one. Let's move now to our part two. Language, communication, and feature is our part two. But before we dwell on communication and its feature, we first wanted to differentiate language versus diet dialect you know this topic is very controversial because a lot of people doesn't know the difference between two that's why in this uh, course i wanted to highlight this one when we say language this is the overall the representative of a country but when we talk about the dialect these are the variation of language meaning language is the same as the dialect almost but we cannot say that dialect is just a minority it is not a minority because dialect is also a language how can we differentiate it well let's take the filipino language as an example when we talk about filipino this is what we call language now what about a dialect well the dialect we are talking about are the varieties Okay, the varieties of these languages. Like for example, Filipino, we have the Filipino as a language and then Tagalog is also part of that Filipino language and there are variations for Tagalog. For example, the Tagalog of my Kawayan or Bulacan is different from the Tagalog of metropo in the mot metropolitan area. Still, it is the same, but they have variation. Again, ah, language is just a representation for the country, but dialect is a variation of that language. Okay? Let's move on for communication. Now, we need to establish communication. And how do we establish communication? It is through language. With language, we can easily interact with people. Is it easy to interact with the same dialect? Yes. How about with different dialect? Still, it is a yes. For example, you can understand my, my Tagalog, although I speak this way. You are from Bulacan and I am from Valenzuela. But still, as you see, we can still understand each other because we have the same di uh, we have we still have the same language, but the, there's just a variation in the language that we have, and that is the dialect. Now, going back to communication, according to Newman and Summer, it is an exchange of facts, ideas, opinions, or emotion. You are expressing your thoughts when you communicate and the people is, or the person you're talking to is receiving that information. So this is the process of communication and its components. So can you explain this in your mind? It's as easy as this. Source, the giver of information, and then it is encoded through a channel, later on we will talk about the different types of channel, the, the, and then the receiver will decode it, and of course, the, that receiver will give a feedback. That is an important part of communication. We cannot do just a linear, and then there's no feedback. It will not be a communication. The simple nod, the simple smile is already a feedback, okay? If there's a feedback that happened, therefore the communication is successful and good. 
Now, these are the communication channel I am talking about. This is the medium as to what you use in order to interact with that person. So there are different types. The first one is the acoustic and or acoustic is the most common type in communicating. Like now, I am using my voice to communicate to you. Tactile is more of the touch. When you hold the person's hands, there is already a meaning into that. Is it a mother's, uh, mother's touch? Or maybe a boyfriend or your girlfriend's touch? That's a tactile and it bears different meaning. Another, optical. Just have to look at the signages that you see. Like for example, when you see this sign going up, meaning you have to go up, you will not go down and it sends you a signal. This one is olfactory, wherein we use senses to give meaning. One good example is um, perfume. Through perfumes, we use perfumes to impress someone. And so other people will also be attracted to you, something like that. Okay, so these are the examples of our types of communication channel. Acoustic, optical, olfactory, and tactile. What are the signs, features of human language? Hockett, 1960, discovered that human language is really unique among all the languages, like the language of animals, the language of different species. Human language has these specific features, and what are those? First is the vocal auditory channel, meaning our uh, acoustic sound, the acoustic sound we are making comes from the mouth and it is received by our ear. Second, rapid fading, meaning it will last. So you see, it lasts my voice or the way I lecture lasted. The sounds that I make lasted. Interchangeability, all the utterances that are understood can be produced. That the importance is that a speaker can physically create any and all messages. We can create any messages as long as, okay, as long as we use our vocal. Total feedback is that you can hear what you say. Like what I am telling you right now, I can hear myself. Specialization, it is uh, specialized for communicating. The signal produced is specialized for communicating and it's not the side effect of some behavior. Other animals kasi, they use that language. Okay, for example, some animals, they use, they produce that language because something happened to them. For example, when you tickle, this is just an example, when you tickle a dog, the dog will suddenly, what do you call this, will suddenly like, bark at you or maybe do a awkward sound but for people when you tickle someone that person will tell you stop it right and the word stop it is specialized for communication so that's it and then semanticity meaning there is in every signal in every language there's a meaning arbitrariness what i told you a while ago we cannot this win window is called window and we do not know why is it called window because there's no window written on the on the object okay discreteness language can be said to be built up from discrete units like we started with a root word and then and then it is combined with uh, with other morphemes like null morphemes and then we create a word a new word displacement it can take anywhere anytime that you wanted to, their communication to take place productivity language is an open system we can produce infinite number of messages emojis the sounds the gestures these are all limitless possibility that you can send communication or maybe a message Cultural transmission, there is a culture in every system. This is, that is also one thing, that when we have the language, a certain culture is embedded into it. Duality of patterning, meaning 
large number of meaningful signals like from a small number to meaningless units like these phonemes we combine this okay we combine this to make it meaningful but there are also some words that are meaningless for example the s the s word s alone that does not have a meaning but when you combine this s to for example flower flowers the flower the meaning of the flower changes like it becomes a plural form prevarication is that we can also this is a sad thing that we can also use the language to be deceptive to others like we can alter the truth that is something that maybe other animals cannot do reflexiveness we can communicate about communication like right now i am talking about uh, the features of communication learnability we can learn a language and for example uh, we can learn spanish chinese japanese languages but for a dog can a dog learn a cat's language? I doubt. So that's it. That's uh, those are the unique features of language. Okay. So that's it for our second part. Let's move on to the third part. Now for our part three, language and communities. So what? is a speech community what is a community well a community is a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common and sometimes or most of the time that uh, that characteristic is what we call the culture like the habits of the people what are their usual reactions what is their food uh, their place the setting their livelihood something like that and the way they live in every day also affects the language that they use it is a social unit with commonality like religion values const uh, customs or identity so monolingual these are the people that uses only one language so they are also called monoglots the example are french people they just know french okay but it depends, uh, I do not say that all French peoples are uh, monolingual. It is just that most of them are like that. Bilingual, of course, by meaning two. There are two people using that language. They have complete and equal command of two languages in all situations. Us Filipinos, most of us are bilingual. We use English and we use Filipino language. But then, and sometimes being a bilingual, it uh, this issue is controversial. Like they they are thinking that it makes you too simple or use sim too simple languages in both of the language that you are using. Okay, so Filipinos are like bilinguals. So what is the process of a childhood uh, childhood bilingual acquisition? In stage one, it's stated that the child builds up a set of words from both languages, but then uh, the, the child learn it separately. Okay, not the same. So this is English, this is Filipino. Then when sentences begin to appear, they started to take note of the grammatical pattern. And lastly, the syntax of that, um, of, that of each of that languages become easier for the child to grasp and then it started to use those languages on specific situation like for example i will use english language when i whenever i lecture you but i will use tagalog whenever i am casually talking to someone so that's it for the developmental stages multilingual are those people who uses many languages three or more also called polyglots so the best example are the pop ones because they are uh, they have a lot of languages with them like 839 they speak 839 languages wow so here are the significant terms when we talk about speech communities we say that in every society there's a specific language that we are talking but not really the society because we have to take note of the following First is the domain. The domain is as simple as the topic. Like, what do you talk about? This is the domain. When we talk about the 
domain, the set, okay, the team of the, uh, the, of the communication, like whenever we talk now, right now, what is our domain? Education, uh, language, culture, and society, English class, adept reviewer, that is our domain. So it answers what are they talking about. Setting, of course, is where the domain takes place. It answers where, okay? The glossa. So what is the glossa? It is a situation in which communities with two languages or two varieties are being used under two different conditions. Like for example, I use this language whenever there's a formal gathering, but I use this certain language then it is just a casual thing. Okay, sometimes it happens with some people, this is just a um, special case, okay? I'm not generalizing everyone. Like, they think that you are a rich kid, you are um, somehow in elite class when you can speak taga uh, when you can speak English. And you, when you just know Tagalog, they think of you lowly. But that's not, that's not a good thing. So, the, the glossa is like that. You use specific language for high or status, the, the status is high, and you use another language for where the status is low. That is the glossa. Polyglossa is the same, but you use three or more dialects of the language. Okay? So that they are the same, but the glossa is just two. Polyglossa, there's a lot. Okay. Now we move on. Speaking of a lot of languages, we move to code switching versus linguistic borrowing. What's the difference between these two? Well, when we talk about code switching, we tend to just feel like change our language for the sake of fitting in. That's code switching. But for linguistic borrowing, we borrow a certain word because we need to, and there's no equivalent word for that. One good example is empanada. What is the Tagalog or the English term for empanada? There's no English or Tagalog term. It is a Spanish term, but we use that. And we do linguistic borrowing. But when we do code switching, it is intentional. Like, where do we need to eat kaya? Like, konyo, the konyo thing. For example, a good example is Chris Aquino. What she always do is code switching. But you know, a good code switching is something that switches from sentence to sentence, not really from word to word. Okay? So, we also have uh, code mixing under code switching. And that is an example of Chris Aquino's language. Okay, so now for the last part of our discussion, we'll talk about the evolution of language. For the last part, it is about the changes in the English language. So there are occurrences wherein our language changes. Now, the thing is, some researchers we were able to identify or to create a, like a formula as to how this evolution started. The first one is Graham's law. So it is already a law, meaning it is proven. There is a pattern where, which he called German consonant shift and the high German consonant shift. So, it gives us a systematic relationship between the consonant that is used by Germanic languages and those in the Indo-European languages. So what happens? What is this law uh, stating? The first one is the German consonant shift. It is the first shift, okay, the first shift of the language that started with Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. That is the German consonant shift. Now, it moves, look at this, pad, pod, ped. So there's a shift of the sound. Tano, tanao, tanius. So something like that. For German consonant shift, that is the first shift. Now, here comes the high German consonant shift, meaning the shift get intense, get higher. So it is only affected by high German languages. The K, T, and P become H, T, A, T, H, and F. And the GDB becomes KTP, like these sounds become like this. What's a good example? From pad, it becomes foot, 
from tanu, it becomes thin. So you see, that is the shift that happens. And it is proven by Green's law. So second is the great vowel shift. A while ago, Grimm's law talks about consonant, but for the great vowel shift, we talk about the vowel itself. So the long vowels were shifted upward, like the way we pronounce it, the our tongue goes upward. So there are eight steps, okay, for great vowel shift. This is like this, step one, two, step eight. So there's the process that happens. So this bite, Beat, beat, bait, bait. So that's the shift that happened from bite, it become bait. From bout, it become boat. Okay, the way you, we pronounce it is like that. From 1450, the bite siya, ngayon, uh, 1700, it become bait. Then, Werner's Law is just an exemption of the Green's Law. This happens because... Uh, there are things that the Grimm's Law cannot explain. So it is Bernal's that suffices it. So what are the theories in language and culture? The first is the Safir War Hypothesis. The Safir War Hypothesis talks about what? I hope you're taking notes, eh? because everything that I have discussed it will really be in the test, okay? in your ADAPT test. Okay, so going back, Safir War believes that in our culture, we are the only one who can understand the language because of the culture that is embedded with it. So the way we think will be affected with our native language. So linguistic relativity. Sapir verb hypothesis is divided into two. The first is linguistic relativity, wherein cultural differences in thinking are accompanied by linguistic differences. For example, we think this way. Therefore, that is the language we produce. One good example is the Filipino language. We are gender neutral. Right? Like the sha. It doesn't refer to he or she. It's like it promotes equality. I, uh, it's like our culture is promoting that kind of thing since the, our language is like that. For linguistic determinism, it determines the language. It is the language that determines us. Like... Um, for the Turkish, they are very consider uh, they are very particular in terms of time, and it appears with the language that they use. They uh, they have a specific language if it happens now, if it happens later on, and if it happens tomorrow, something like that. There's a particular verb inserted, so that's linguistic uh, determinism. The difference between relativity and determinism is just the verb. Language is related to culture, but for determinism, uh, the culture determines the language. Second is ethnopoetics. Uh, this is as simple as this. Our language is being nourished, being enriched because the literature, of the literature, the poets, the sings, the chants, and everything. This um, suffices the art of the language that we have. And then the oral gesture, it believes that the origin of language is like the evolution of sound combined with the gesture that we have. It should be oral plus gesture. But then there are critics that says that you cannot gesture everything. You cannot give an action to everything that you do. Okay, so now let's move on with the language shift in there. Do languages die? Of course they do. When do they die or when do language shift? Well, it shifts when a certain group will move on to another language or they use another language. It's like eradication of the local languages. So what is the factor? The first factor is economic. Of course, if you use that language and then you cannot do business when using that language and you have to shift to another. Therefore, that's economic factor. The demographic, the place, the place where you use that language or the population, there are less and less of people using that language. Attitude and values, you think that your language is not good. You think that your language sometimes pulls you down as to your character. So it can be a factor. So how do languages die? It is simple as no one uses the language. 
Simple as that. When the elders um, do not no longer wanted to teach, or maybe these elders are the only ones who know the language and they no longer wanted to teach those um, early generation, then languages will die on that part. So if there's only one person and and that person uh, speak the tongue fluently and then they refuse to teach it, therefore it will die. So language dead and language not. But can language be retrieved? Yes, language can be retrieved. So how? Well, it uh, there's a language wherein they started again a brigade and they started to teach people has to as to how to use this language and then language become alive again. So there are four types of language death. Gradual death, dahan-dahan. Okay, hindi na mamalaya, nawawala na. So then, bigla na lang na-extinct yung language na yun. Radical death, it's like you stop using the language for your self-defense. Kadalasan sa mga war. Para hindi ka mapatay, hindi ka hulihin, ibahin mo language mo. Bottom to top death is when you just don't want to use that because it's like for the religion and the folk songs. Like, for example, the yung mga language na patay na, pero ginagamit lang for folk songs. Okay, so remember this to end. When all the people who speak a language die, the language dies with them. Okay, so we have to nourish our language. We have to take care of our language, especially the Filipino language, because this is our identity, because this is who we are. So that's my ending quotation for this afternoon. I hope you learned a lot and you reminisced everything, every concept that we discussed from the first semester. That's all and have a good day. Thank you.